Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome very much uh, to the second of Avmat's Excavating Shipwrecked lecture series called Le Dragon. And for those of you in the cabins, it's good to see you as well. And uh, please, if you've got any questions, don't hesitate to catch me when I'm in and around the ship, as I know people get a whole range of questions. What about this? What about that? And what's this scenario? And uh, we'll be delighted to talk with them. So we're going to be talking about the dragon. Now, if you remember from my first lecture, hopefully everybody came to there. We talked about what is marine archaeology, uh, what is treasure hunting. Uh, we went through the tile wreck, um, which is a wreck we've been working on for a number of years. And uh, that gave uh, you some idea on what sort of things we're finding from this time period in the Caribbean. And this next wreck is the same as most of the wrecks we get asked to do. The government uh, becomes aware of a shipwreck. And it's a race against time as to who gets there first, the treasure hunters uh, or the archaeologists. And we are the only archaeological unit operating uh, in the Dominican Republic. Um, over the years, we have managed to uh, uh, assist the government with closing down uh, of all treasure hunting activities, uh, which is good. And uh, I gave an address at uh, the United Nations at uh, UNESCO conference in 2009 the first confluence for the underwater cultural heritage. And uh, you know, all, all the big countries were talking first, and then it went to the non-signatory parties, and America, Canada uh, started speaking. Uh, and then it went to the NGOs, and uh, we managed to get about a 15-minute slot, which was wonderful. And one of the things I said was, it's all very well for the European nations to say, well, this is fantastic. We must protect our patrimony and our heritage wherever it is. That in itself is wonderful. Uh, but when it comes to the Caribbean, uh, it seems to be a long way away from Paris. And a lot of people tend to forget that the Caribbean nations have the greatest of challenges in trying to protect other people's patrimony when they have very limited resources at all. And one of the things I suggested to the UNESCO conference was that the um, governments, or in particular, of uh, France, uh, Spain, Portugal, and England, really needed to start thinking along these lines of assisting uh, the Caribbean nations for the protection of their underwater cultural heritage, because it really is their heritage. And one of the differences we have between ships is that if it's a merchant ship, it's a question of ownership. Who owns the ship? Well, a lot of questions come into play. The insurance companies that probably paid out on the hull of the ship or the cargo uh, of the ship. Uh, you might have the issue of territorial waters, and certainly all the shipwrecks that I'm operating on are in territorial waters. In fact, they're so shallow uh, that sometimes you don't even know they're there until a storm uncovers them. But when it comes to uh, military vessels, in particular, uh, when we're talking about the uh, sovereignty of the United States, well, unfortunately, I haven't got too many wrecks from the United States. It's a little bit more modern uh, than my time period. But certainly, we have the issue of Spain, we have the issue of France, and to a lesser extent, we have the issue of the UK. And I say that to a lesser extent because very few English ships were actually sunk uh, in the Caribbean. Uh, it mainly seemed to be the French and the Spanish uh, that lost their ships. And so the equations come on to a play is, how do you know it's a military vessel until you do the survey and the excavation? And I was talking to uh, one of the gentlemen just now, and he said, well, how do you address the issue of human remains? You know, if it's a sovereign warship, then uh, that Im involves a complete new strategy as to how that ship is. It's a bit like uh, suddenly finding the French embassy. Well, it's sovereign property of France. You have to knock on the door before you go in. You have to get permission, etc., etc. And so we take the view that if there's a wreck, we get to it first. We give it the highest level of archaeological credence, and we do the best we can. And we don't differentiate between uh, merchant ships, warships. It's a question of what is right for that vessel. As a maritime archaeologist, we owe a duty of care for the protection of that uh, human remains, of that artifact, of that hull, against all odds and against all perils, which sometimes is, is quite a challenge. We have to uh, educate uh, government departments that this is possibly what they should be doing. And yes, sir, may I suggest X, Y, and Z as the best course of action. But most of the wrecks we know nothing about. And so, uh, as I said from my last lecture, it's a question of history, mystery, and a bit of Baywatch tied in as well, whereby we have to look at every single clue. 
And eventually, if we are extremely lucky, we will find out the entire story. And this one here, we were certainly able to do. And it's a lovely story. One of these days, uh, uh, I'm sure that uh, they will make a film about it, which will be great. Uh, if not, I wouldn't, see, wouldn't be surprised to see some reference in it with one of the latest Clive Cussler novels, because uh, he always seems to get the wonderful stories where he mixes uh, the historical fact uh, with his uh, fiction and his stories, and they go together very well indeed. The first thing we knew about this wreck was that uh, we were almost walking upon it. Um, we were on the beach. We knew that the treasure hunters had stolen some cannons. Um, we know that uh, some small anchors had gone, and so therefore there must be a ship somewhere. But we didn't know where. We didn't know what. And uh, the fishermen were sort of you know, parking their boats uh, over it. And so we started using uh, geophysical equipment, uh, proton magnetometers. Uh, if you remember from my last lecture, they uh, differentiate between the magnetic field of the Earth's magnetic core and the local magnetic field. So cannons, anchors, and things will change that magnetic field and give you a clue. And we started uh, using all this geophysical equipment, and we got a very large hit right in the shallows. And what I mean in the shallows, it was about five feet deep. Uh, we were almost wading over what later turned out to be the wreck itself. And the fishermen got a little bit worried about, you know, what are they doing? You know, they all, so we had to move all their boats out the way and so forth. And uh, we located the wreck, uh, as it says here, about 30 meters from the water's edge, uh, in two to four meters uh, of water, depending on the tide. The initial scatter pattern was about 300 meters. Now, by that scatter pattern, I mean, what is the furthest extent of any archaeological impact that this wreck has had uh, from the center. Now, we didn't know that we had the center. We just got the highest reading, and that became uh, the center as far as uh, recording. And then over a number of months, um, that's how long it takes, using archaeological water dredges, we literally uncovered the wreck. We had three dredges going five hours a day uh, in almost zero conditions, uh, because the little beach, as I'll show you later on where it was located, uh, there was a stream, and uh, you could see, looking through the sand, the topography, we had black sand, yellow sand, black sand, yellow sand. And whenever there would be flash floods, all the mud would come down from the farms and the fields and go out onto the bay. And then the sea would then push in the sand, and then the mud would come down. So you have a sandwich going backwards and forwards in relation to all this lot. Well, the challenge is when we're actually uncovering the wreck, uh, we're almost in zero visibility, because the mud is mud. So. Uh, that means the visibility goes. And we're using the dredge, and the dredge is normally a, a, on your shoulder like this, and you're hand fanning into the nozzle of the dredge, which then sucks the sand away, and you're feeling your way along. And it, you, blindfolded almost is, is, is a good thing. Uh, the computers are audio, so we know when we're running out on air. Uh, but one of the biggest worries was twofold. One, that we would uh, catch ourselves on the copper sheeting because uh, we found uh, sections of copper sheeting and it had nails on it all over the place, particularly nasty to get uh, uh, attached to. And the other one was the, the running the risk of a cannon falling on top of us uh, because we would go up like this, oh yes, oh yes, concretion, concretion, and slowly hand fan all the way around and then, oh yes, that's a cannon, it's a cannon right. What is it resting on is the next big question. Uh, and then we'd have to go around the top of it, totally uncover section. I'll show you some pictures later on, uh, section by section of it. Uh, so we know that we are safe um, because they're nine pounders, uh, they weigh a couple of tons of beef, and uh, we certainly didn't want any of uh, those on top of it. We uncovered the bow section first, uh, as it so happened. Uh, then we went all the way back uh, towards the stern on both sides of the vessel. Uh, we had to dig down to the keel uh, on the port side of the vessel, which is the left-hand side of, of the vessel, uh, and we were going down through 12 feet uh, of sand by the time we were finished. That's, uh, as an estimation, that's probably the height of this room. So if you, look, if you think about this, where we are here, uh, if we were to excavate all of this room, that would probably be about what we did, uh, and, and quite a large um, section of activity. And it took us a while to do that. And at the end of that, we got a vessel that was about 18 meters long, 4 meters wide, and uh, 4.2 meters high. So we only had the lowest sections of the ship itself. So we started building the grid and so forth. And one of the things we we're working out is, what is this ship doing here? Why is it here? It's got cannons on it. But when it was wrecked, the cannons are worth a lot of money, especially 
uh, when we're talking battles between the English and the French. So why weren't they removed? Uh, what are they still doing here? And we have to think about the Caribbean. And we're looking here. Uh, here's the Dominican Republic, where we are. We're actually sailing somewhere down here, I think, at the moment, give or take. And uh, we have to remember that since the days of Columbus, uh, all the way up to about the uh, early 1800s, this center island here, the Dominican Republic, was one of the most important islands, in particular for France, the French Empire, and the Spanish Empire before that. And it needed all the raw materials that the island can give uh, to support the battle wagons, the fleets. Now, one of my other lectures, uh, the White House Bay Rack, which I'll come on to, talks a little bit more about it. And for those people who've been watching the television in your cabins, there's a film, Caribbean Wreck Heaven, uh, where we talk about some of the work we've been doing in St. Kitts. Uh, which is 1783. And we talk about the two big Caribbean battle fleets where history was dictated by the strengths of these ships. Uh, the French would have about 30 or 40 ships. Now, they don't describe anything below a, a capital ship, which is a first rate, second rate, and third rate. Uh, first rate would have about 1,000 men on it. Second rate, 900. Uh, third rate, only 700 men, something like that. And when you get 30 of these big monsters coming in a line, and then you get the English, which also have the same number of ships, and they just fire cannonballs at each other, backwards and forwards, um, you have to think that there's about sort of 80,000 men on that combined fleet. And that doesn't include all the incendiary. Frigates, for example, weren't even mentioned in dispatches. And occasionally a frigate captain would come along line, uh, one of the first-rate ships, and uh, would try its luck. And then it was fair play for the uh, larger ship to open fire on the small ship. Otherwise, it was regarded as very bad form uh, for the captain to fire on such an inferior vessel as a frigate. So there were all sorts of rules and regulations. Either way, um, getting back to the Caribbean, this is where everything happened. And we also have St. Kitts down here, and you have the Martinique, obviously, French. And so you have these battle fleets that go up and down, up and down, up and down. The French, on average, could last uh, some in the region of seven to eight weeks away from France before they have to go back to resupply because they have to clean the weeds from the bottom of the ship. They have to have more cannonballs and various other things like that. So uh, that's a little bit of the history of the, uh, as far as naval warfare is concerned in that region. We were looking at maps and charts and this was the best map that we had. And it's a, a, a Dominican army map. And it shows here's the sea and it shows a little cut here at a place called Buen Hombre and that is uh, effectively where this ship is located. Now, the key thing to bear in mind is we've got coral reef here, coral reef all the way up the coast, except for at Buen Ombre. There is only one place where the coral does not uh, go all the way up to the shoreline. And funnily enough, our ship was slap bang in the middle. Uh, it's almost as if they couldn't have done any better. Here we have, courtesy of Google, wonderful thing these days, makes my life infinitely easier. Here we have the reefs I was talking about all the way along. Here we have Buen Hombre, reef, 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 reef. And here down here there is a cut where there is no reef and it goes all the way up to the beach. And that is exactly where the ship is. And it's so positioned that it gave us a clue that it was deliberately sailed straight up the beach in a superb uh, manner of uh, seamanship because it didn't touch the reef on either side, which was about 20 or 30 feet. Now, in this ship, the captain has powerful thrusters and so forth, and he can spin the ship probably on its own axis and do all sorts of wonderful things. Unfortunately, with sailing ships, you have to sail depending where the wind goes. Um, and the, generally, the wind comes from this direction here, so they were probably going in a, what we call a broad reach. And it, nevertheless, it's, it's a remarkable piece of uh, seamanship. This is one of the pictures we got uh, from the government. Uh, it is a nine-pound cannon, uh, iron cannon, that got um, liberated uh, or looted, depending on which way you look at it, uh, by the treasure hunters. Uh, sufficient to say it's in very good condition. It has no coral growth around it, which means that it was buried deeply in the sand. And uh, we also uh, got this photograph. It is a grapnel anchor uh, from a longboat. Uh, and that went through, the commission managed to retrieve it from the treasure hunters, and uh, there you can see it uh, in conservation. Conservation for an anchor like this would probably take somewhere in the region of four years, uh, just to remove the salts uh, from inside it. And uh, here you can see the, the palms of the anchor. It's all fitted together. And these were ideal for reef 
uh, areas and so forth, but again for small boats. So we learned that um, the, the cannons that had been looted had actually been repositioned under a dock and we went with the government and we managed to uh, raise them and get as much information as possible. Uh, so here we have the fun of uh, raising one of the cannons uh, up and uh, doing a bit of documentary uh, about it. There was only one boom crane in the area that we had to find. And uh, when we started, literally, uh, I mean, uh, it's always nice looking down the end of a muzzle of a gun, and you can see all the concentric rings around the cannon. Yes, it's got what we call warts on it, uh, where the iron has uh, puffed up. But nevertheless, it was in excellent state of preservation, and we started getting a lot of information from it. The beauty with these type of cannons is they were numbered. So we had a serial number, and we know that they were Scottish. And uh, it's Scottish number 982, uh, made in 1778, so we have what we call a diagnostic artifact. It gives us the date, uh, which is absolutely crucial. Uh, we, know that, we know that it was made by Caron. Now, the Caron Iron Foundry was uh, actually in Scotland, in Falkirk. Uh, it was a manufacturer of cannons, and unfortunately, it lost its royal warrant uh, to the uh, English, uh, which basically means to maintain your royal warrant, you have to send a batch of 30 cannons, and they are fired 30 times in in repetition, and if one of them blows up, then that means you haven't made them properly and you lose your royal warrant. The second important thing that we note is that these were of a certain age that we call the last of the nine pounders, literally. In other words, the last of the long guns. Before, the Caron company came up with a new idea. Let's cross a cannon with a mortar, and we'll call it a Caronade after the company. And uh, very, very popular in the United States uh, for their warships because it was shorter, the recoil was less, and it fired a heavier ball over a shorter period of time. So it gave us some good information. I remember contacting the, 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 uh, the Caron Iron Company. Obviously, when cannons started falling out of popularity, they went into making bathtubs. Iron bathtubs were pretty good until plastics came. And the company went bankrupt in 1983. So I managed to track somebody down who used to work there, and with great excitement, I rang up and I said, listen, we found one of your cannons. Oh, wonderful, delighted to hear that. I said, tell me, what happened to your archives? Because we really need to know where this cannon went. You must have a record of who you sold it to. And there was a pregnant pause at the other end of the telephone line, and she said, yes, well, we have a problem with that. When the company went bankrupt, we didn't know what to do with all our archives going back a couple hundred years, so we got a 50-gallon drum and just burnt it all. So unfortunately, we uh, basically had a dead end. So whilst the cannons were wonderful, they'd given us as much information as they could, um, we were drawing a blank. So here we have the beach. As you see, it's a beautiful beach. There's not really much here. We've got some hills there. We've got a nice bit of sand around here. The wreck itself is about here. And we've got reef this side and reef that side. And the tubes that you're looking at uh, are part of our water dredge. So we set up three small yolas. And each of them had a, a trash pump on it, and we started literally digging down underneath the water. The whole of this triangle section had to be removed all the way down, uh, almost uh, to, the, to bedrock, as they say. We also, on the beach, managed to find uh, some wooden artifacts. Now, this one here is part of a rudder. Uh, so obviously, a lot of excitement and so forth. There were three parts that fitted together. When we analyzed it, we found that it was a jury rig rudder. In other words, it wasn't of the same condition as you would expect a shipyard to have. This one had all sorts of little things on it. it they made nails out of ironwood. Ironwood, obviously, like mahogany, very, very, very hard. Um, they had put copper sheeting on it afterwards as sort of a, you know, hamstrung sort of a attitude. And they put uh, tar and uh, muslin on it and things like that to protect it. Not the quality of the shipyard. But we realized that this would have probably come from the wreck and that it must have lost its rudder or something would have happened earlier on which enabled it uh, to be jury rigged. Well, as we then started uncovering the wreck, we started to get these timbers. Now, I'm going to talk about a few timbers. The keel, obviously, is the backbone of the ship. We have the garboard straits, which are the bottom planking, the first bottom planking that slots in either side, where we have the groove, which is what we call the rabbit. We have the floors that go across the ship. And then we have the keelson that is nailed all the way through, uh, sandwiching the whole thing together. And then we have the other timbers we'll called the first futtocks, uh, which come close up to the keel. And then you have the second futtock, which is attached to the end of the floor. And so the ship is uh, constructed as it goes around. 
So this is one of the first things we, we saw, and uh, we're looking at it now to people looking at it. Yes, you can see some nice numbers uh, down on the bottom there. Uh, what you're looking at are those timbers that are coming out towards you. Uh, here we have some futtocks that are eaten away by the worms. Uh, we have the cargo deck, and you're looking down straight down the muzzle of a cannon, uh, which is looking uh, almost uh, straight towards me. As we went round the port side of the ship, we could clearly see the difference between the futtocks and the floors and the futtocks. Uh, we could see the bottom of the hull down here. We could see the cargo deck. And on top of the cargo deck was the ballast, which kept the ship upright uh, and stable and could be moved around to fine trim the vessel. We then started finding larger and larger timbers as we got to the midship's position. Uh, here, for example, you've got a 25 centimeter scale uh, to give you an element of uh, size. And we had to dig way through. Here, for example, frame 36 and 37 were double framed together. They were there because they were part of a repair work, uh, which gave us further clues that the ship had been repaired at some time during its life, uh, and that, that it was done reasonably well, but it wasn't done to the same standard as the original part of the ship. Now we've uh, probably uncovered 12 feet now, and I'm floating on the surface trying to get as much as I can in the camera's lens. You can see all the rock. The first thing we notice is that it, that it is literally rock. It's not bricks or things that could sell. These are ballast stones. Uh, and a military vessel would keep the same ballast stones that it got from day one. Whereas a merchant ship would have things that it could sell. You know, if it wanted more heavy cargo, they'd sell away some of the ballast stones or the bricks. Whereas a merchant ship, they would have everything fine-tuned. Here we have the floors and futtocks that are pointing out towards us. We've got bottom planking. We've got what we call the beginning of the curvature uh, of the hull. So we're beginning to get ideas that this was a military ship rather than a merchant ship. Here, for example, we have the bow and we have copper sheeting that is still in excellent state of preservation. And one of the things I look at that is I say, well, this backs up our theory that the captain knew what he was doing because he sailed straight up that beach without hitting the, uh, the reef on either side. And here's the evidence that proves he didn't hit anything because the bow is in perfect condition. Uh, the copper sheeting is all there, wrapped around itself. Um, and in fact, interestingly enough, they put the copper sheeting on the wrong way round. Um, they started uh, from the top and worked its way down rather than from the bottom and worked its way up. But nevertheless, um, it gave us some information. Copper sheeting was really used um, it was started uh, by the English in around about 1760 at the very earliest time frame. Uh, and then by obviously 1800, every ship, or well, most of the ships were using it. But it, went, it was the state of the art because it enabled ships to stay at sea longer and faster they would go. Here, for example, we've got some repair works again on frame 42 and 43, which gives us indication that there must have been something serious that happened to the hull that allowed them uh, to uh, do this, and where was it done? It's not something you can do while you're in anchor. Here we have what we call a trunnel. It's like a wooden dowel or a peg, and uh, they're used for holding all the timbers together. But we had a contradiction, because at one point we've got a wooden dowel, which is an early type of uh, ship's construction, and we've got copper sheeting, which is a much later time period. So either way, this ship must have been built then, then it wasn't used, and then we had copper sheeting at the end. So we've got conflicting clues, probably with about 30, 40 year time frame uh, between them. So we needed to narrow it down. And we were finding very few personal artifacts, which is hardly surprising, considering it's almost up the beach. Here, for example, we've got a shoe from a, uh, an officer's boot. Uh, this is the heel as we're slowly uh, uncovering it. We're now looking at cannon number one, and you can see bricks. So you see, aha, parts of cargo. I say, no, unfortunately, that's not the case. The bricks are from the ship's galley. Where do you put a galley in a warship? Generally towards the front of the ship, whereby the last thing you want is the cannonball coming through the middle of the ship, hitting the gallery, and then sending hot, broken bricks, uh, fragments like shrapnel all over the place. So the galley was out of the way at the front, um, which is exactly where we found it. Here we have the cannon. We've got some forward mast rings here. As you see, it looks a bit of a mess, and we're going to have to go through uh, and look at it. At the other end of the vessel, we had some interesting things. This is the, the back, the stern end of the vessel. Here we have the remains of the ballast. Here we have one of the iron pins, uh, keel bolts. Here we have the keel, and here we have the bottom of the ship. 
And uh, I'm now looking straight down where the keelson would have been, and that is long gone. Here you've got the iron keel bolt. And these large square ballasts have been pre-cut to fit deliberately into that slot. And the only thing that is holding that and defying gravity is a little bit of concretion. So obviously we had to be rather careful that these heavy blocks didn't rain down upon us. But looking at the uh, top of the keel, uh, we found two interesting things. We've got copper sheeting and we've got iron bolts. What electrolysis, unfortunately, means that if you have copper sheeting, seawater as electrolyte, iron bolts, they react and the iron bolts give in, they give way. And England lost a number of ships as a result of this new transitional period where they didn't understand the issue of copper sheeting and uh, uh, electrolysis. So it gives us an idea that we're talking early, around about 1780s now. Uh, Porringer, uh, that would have been uh, in the barber surgeon's uh, place, uh, used for bleeding uh, purposes and for first aid, made of pewter. Uh, looking at the keel further down, we notice that an additional keel had been bolted on to the bottom of the other keel uh, to give it additional lateral stability. Something very unusual was going on with this ship. It had characteristics that didn't tie in. If it was an English ship or if it was a French ship, why would you then have an additional keel uh, attached to it. This is the forward mast hole. Uh, the mast would be uh, slotted in at the base of the mast. There will be a square insertion which will go in there. A uh, very important thing to find. Beautiful uh, condition. Excellent um, craftsmanship. Unfortunately, no silver or gold coin underneath, as I mentioned on the last one. So uh, we're missing a bit of evidence. But we did start finding hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of musket balls. Uh, in one square meter, we found 430 just on the surface. And the caliber of the musket ball is the same size as you would expect to find in a French musket. So we're again now pointing towards France uh, as far as that is concerned. We also found a whole bunch of other things. Uh, here we have uh, some um, blocks and tackles uh, that were found in the bosun's store. We found a leather pouch with some tobacco in it, uh, American, um, we believe. We also found that looking down the muzzle of the cannons, it gave us all sorts of clues. Uh, here, for example, we have coral and other things that were growing on there, which meant that it, over a period of time, the cannon had been covered, uncovered, allowing the coral to grow uh, before it was totally buried. We started looking at uh, ordnance, uh, and this is a whole collection of different types of shot, chain shot, and so forth. Here we have the important one, and that is an inverted bar shot, a cannonball with a pipe in between it, as it's far from the cannon, it spins around and chops everything in its way, designed for masts and, and things of that nature. The English only use this one because they believed that the rounded end would be more aerodynamic. So while we're on shot, here you have an English one. Oh dear, we've got an English clue this time. Uh, and here you can see it, the dome head. Here you've got the center part and you've got the dome at the other end there. Uh, however, if you look carefully at this cannon here, uh, you'll find we've got a French version also underneath. So at this point in time, we're really confused. We've got French and English ordnance. We've got Scottish guns. We've got a ship, as far as the construction is concerned, that doesn't really sort of tie in. Um, what on earth have we got? Um, after conservation, um, just to show you what they look like, here we have a, uh, what we call a, a slingshot, so to speak. That does a lot of damage if it hits you, I can assure you. So looking at the bow section here, um, you can see there are three cannons that, that are on the bow section. A lot of work um, required to actually uncover it. Very small bits of pottery. Uh, we found Domino. I always find Lucky Six is always good for the artifact because it means we find it and put it in conservation. But there we are, Sailor's Domino. Uh, we have to bear in mind that uh, Grape Shot was something that we weren't expecting and we did a lot of research. Now, a grape shot is like small cannonballs that are all packed together with muslin around it, twined in, so it looks like a bag of grapes. And it's on a wooden uh, tampion base with an iron spindle, and it's loaded into the cannon, and it fired at close quarters, and it does all sorts of devastation to men and machinery and rigging. And here you have a, a, a graphic illustration of a six-pound English grape shot. And on the next one, uh, we have comparisons between the English and the French. Uh, the French wanted more balls for their bang, and so they had an extra tier of uh, grape shot, as you can see on the right side there. So the question we had, having got all the measurements and dimensions from the archives, we started looking at the grape shot we found on the site, such as we have here, 
And uh, we found that uh, they did tie in very much with the French methodology of grape shot. And uh, here, for example, you can see the wooden base, and it's got a gas seal for a piece of cord uh, to go around it. Here we've got all the balls. Can't really see much because of the concretion. Uh, and so this is what it's like after conservation has been done. But we found that the quality of this was excellent because each of the individual balls were wrapped in muslin to stop them rusting. And this is the only one I've ever known in existence. It is a grape shot recharger. <laughs> and uh, they were packed uh, so that the master at arms could make new grape shot whenever he wished. And each of the balls is wrapped in muslin, uh, which means that they won't start sticking to each other uh, with all the rust. And this was recovered uh, from the wreck site. This is rather fun. It's a, it's a tap. Well, what's so good about a pewter tap? Well, the interesting thing is the handle itself is the key. That comes out so it can go in the captain's pocket and he can try to make sure when his men aren't drinking too much wine. A little bit of porcelain, as you would expect uh, in the officers' quarters. Uh, we started finding bits of French faience wear, not too much, uh, nothing really that was diagnostic. Uh, military buttons, obviously very important. We did a lot of research. Uh, here we have the 90th Regiment of Dragoons. And it was the buttons that started giving us the clue. First of all, it pointed us in a completely wrong time period, because obviously regiments go on for a period of time. And we thought that it was part of the reinvasion fleet of, uh, of uh, 1802. Uh, but we then found out that with the combination of the French Marine on board, that um, it was from a different and earlier time period. And here we have an officer, French officer of Marines button. And uh, here, this is what the drawing uh, looks like. And uh, some more buttons uh, that were found uh, on board. The poor old sailors obviously only got the cheap bone buttons. So there we have the sailors to keep the sailors happy. And one of the other things that you'd expect sailors to have is a lice comb, obviously, uh, health and hygiene and so forth. Uh, the spoons, well, these were from the officer's mess. They were tin spoons and they were plated, uh, sorry, they were pewter spoons plated with tin so that they could give them a quick polish and they looked like silver, what we call a poor man's silver. Fire anchor, very good for boarding enemy ships. You have that uh, along a rope, you sort of coil it, a bit like a lasso, and then you start throwing it over the side of the other vessel. It catches on like an anchor and then you haul the two vessels together and secure them while you are boarding the enemy ship. This is a very important uh, piece, uh, very rare to find. It's what we call a worm, and I'm going to go on to the next one, which shows it better. Uh, these are gunner's implements, and uh, here we have the worm. It's like a corkscrew. After you fire the cannon, there's a whole bunch of hot embers in there where you don't want to put another gunpowder charge in, otherwise it's likely to blow up in your face. So you put the, uh, the corkscrew in, and you rake out any of the hot embers. And we started finding these and other items such as the gun carriage lashing hook in various places as we were excavating. And uh, that gave us a clue that wherever we started finding these, we knew there was a cannon uh, nearby. Uh, bearing in mind we're doing this in very low visibility, uh, it's useful to have clues that tell us where we are on board the ship. This also is part of the gun carriage assembly. Um, and here you can see what the gun carriage would have looked like uh, of this time period. Uh, here you've got the cap squares that hold the trunnions, the hinges of the gun uh, together. Here we've got one of those uh, rings that I was talking about, and those vertical um, bars that we talked about would be sort of vertically going down this way. And the whole thing will be held in place uh, with, those with those hooks. The wooden blocks, uh, here we have a fiddler block, um, which I showed you last time uh, in very good preservation. Uh, we sorted in the archives the size and dimensions that would be expected to be found on a French warship. And here we have two of them uh, that match the two that we found um, on the wreck site. We also found these. These are quite fun. These are copper sheeting uh, parts to go on the, on the hull when there was a hole in the hull. They were pre-made patches already. Poor sailor had to go over the side, hammer them in place without getting shot in the process uh, to stop the, the hull leaking. No, rather useful but simple way of uh, repairing patches. So all we had left to go on was the ship's construction. Not exactly the easiest thing to do, because there are very few plans of ships of this time period. And so we started looking at different sized ships. And uh, the English, because their ships were designed for transatlantic to go around the empire, were built solidly. 
And what we call the rising ceiling, where the first mast step is, if you draw a horizontal line and then drew the, the angle of as the timber rises up, what we call the rising ceiling, was a good clue. Ours was flat. There was no rising ceiling. And so as far as English ships are concerned, uh, it wasn't a very good match. The other side was what we call the angle of dead rise, which goes on, basically, this one here looks like a sow's bum, so to speak. Here you've got the, the keel, the angle from the horizontal as to the side of the vessel uh, is called the angle of dead rise. It matched rather nicely, but both of them have to match to give us a clue. Uh, we started looking at uh, well, a different type of vessel, a schooner, fast attack vessel, uh, and found that it didn't match at all. Uh, we looked at the French frigates of the time period. Here we have a powerful 18-pounder uh, frigate called the San Herbe, slightly later ship's construction. Uh, and unfortunately, that didn't match, although it was better than the English. And it's only when we started looking at the American design that we found it that they matched very nicely. Here we have the American Hancock. It was captured by the English and very flat at the front. And that's exactly what we've got. Um, we've got a rising ceiling that matches ours. Um, which is very important. Here we have the curvature of the hull, uh, of what we assume from, uh, from measurements of what we've got. And so the nearest thing we could get to it here is uh, plans. This is for the Raleigh. It was one of 13 ships built for the first American uh, Navy in 1776. Uh, it was designed with a totally flat uh, rising ceiling uh, we have here. Very important. Uh, it gave us a final clue but it also gave us a lot of conflict. We've got French, we've got American, we've got Scottish. What is going on with this vessel? Here we have a model that was made over 100 years ago uh, of the Raleigh, and it's probably the closest uh, example of what we're going to find on the Dragon. The sail plan to give you an idea. So, putting everything together, we thought we got a high probability of a French or possibly American early 12 or 9 pound frigate built in America using shallow water design, which was ideal for the Caribbean, uh, where it could zip in between the reefs and so forth. We estimated it was built between 1760 and 1770 from the ship's construction, not used for some time, and then rearmed and added a copper sheeter and also the additional keel that I talked about to provide additional uh, strength. And we know that she had Scottish guns on board, which probably would have been purchased in the United States. We think that it lost its original rudder and a new one was built from the rudder that we found on the beach. We clearly knew that she was beached and that the upper work was salvaged and probably taken apart for local buildings over the years. And like most of our wrecks, it was covered and forgotten uh, until we managed to find it. Well, with that information, which is not a lot to go on, we spent two years in the archives in France and then we found the entire story. It was a French corvette armed with 18 nine-pounders that was finally beached to invade capture on the 22nd of January 1783. She was originally an English ship that was captured in the Channel Islands. Not good news for the English, good news for the French. She was taken into the uh, French Royal Navy. We know exactly how much the King of France paid for the vessel and it was transferred to the Lorient Squadron. We then found out that uh, she was pierced originally for 20 cannons and she was armed with a combination of whatever guns that they could find around and a number of swivel cannons and had 120 men. So it was a fairly cramped uh, vessel. She was 69 feet long, uh, as it says here, roughly uh, you know, 23, 24 feet wide, uh, an interior height of eight feet. So I could stand up underneath the deck, which is very nice, um, but that's about all really, a small boat for so many people. On the 1st of April, 18, 1782, she was on convoy duty escorting ships from Lorient and Brest, and she went and received orders to go to Philadelphia under the command of a French noble, which, as we say, Marquis de Puy. He also was a knight of Malta, as we found out later on, and a spy for the government of France when he went to Jamaica, uh, and a whole bunch of other wonderful stuff we found. She encountered a lot of bad storms in the Atlantic, and she had to jettison all her old original cannons, and uh, she couldn't make it to Philadelphia, so she went into Boston. And uh, in Boston, in May 1782, she was placed into dry dock, and the American shipyard rebuilt the hull to American shallow water design, which ties in exactly with what we were trying to work on together. Nevertheless, she came out. She went back to France. Unfortunately for the English, she captured an English ship en route. 
not really a good idea, but there we are. And so that was taken in as a prize uh, and sailed off uh, back to France. And when she got to France, she was then covered with the latest state-of-the-art copper sheeting that would make her faster, nimble, and uh, could stay out in station for a long period of time. And she was rearmed. Now, we don't know whether she was rearmed in Boston or whether she was rearmed uh, in, uh, in France, but bearing in mind that the guns could only be sold in America at the time period, we, uh, that's our best guess at this moment in time. We found in the archives the orders, and this is a copy, in fact, no, it's the original of the order, uh, dated the 15th of February, uh, 1783. It's, it's talking about the Corvette, the Dragon, and Captain Dupree and his orders. His orders are to go to the Dominican Republic or Hispaniola. And off he goes. He was carrying a very important cap per person, a mister. He was also a major, which means if he was captured, he wouldn't be shot outright as a spy. But he was a spy, nevertheless. And he was carrying vital, important documents from the King of France and, we believe, the Vatican, although we haven't had confirmation from the Vatican. Very difficult getting into their archives, but there we are. We know that he was carrying messages from the King of France for the governor of uh, Santo Domingo. And uh, we now know all about that, those messages, which I'll come on to now when I've got a, a quick breathing slot. The King of France wanted to take over the whole of Americas. He thought that England would lose, and so therefore he created a secret society, a, a League of Gentlemen, if you would like, with the emblem of a bumblebee which Napoleon then took on later on, and the National Histoire Museum in Paris still has as their emblem. Uh, an unknown American by the name of Benjamin Franklin was also uh, in this little team of elite, so to speak, and their objective was to rule the Americas and the Caribbean once the English had been defeated. So a lot of communications were going backwards and forwards in secrets, and we also found the cipher for the secret code that was on this secret letter. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to cipher all of it because it used two ciphers, as it was a royal uh, communique. But we have been able to find the reply from the governor of Santo Domingo saying, thank you, your eminence, very much for the packages you sent me, which were presuming are jewelry for his wife. And yes, I will immediately invade the Turks and Caicos Islands and send 30,000 men as you requested. And we will do this as a diversionary tactic uh, while we look at Florida Keys and other, other places to try to keep the English at bay. So useful cross-referring of information. Uh, as we said, the Vatican, we're not quite sure. But we are coming towards the end of the Revolutionary uh, War. Anyway, the English realized that there was a spy on board. And so Admiral Hood and his Caribbean squadron sent 14 ships after the dragon to capture her. They wanted the documents. The simple thing is to capture the vessel. And that's exactly what they've done. And uh, the, here we have the Punta Russia passage. Here is where the wreck is, down here, Buon Hombre. And the ship was coming through here, and basically 14 ships all the way round, uh, totally sealed in. Captain Dupree realizing he had a bit of a challenge here. And uh, so he went through the reefs, being a shallow water ship, he could do that. The English, crazily enough, sent a second-rate ship of the line, a 74-gunner, and HMS Dorking, a 54-gunner, through the reefs, which is a, a bold statement, and the gun battle commenced. So for two noisy days, uh, they were, the, the Dragon was trying to avoid capture, and the two English ships were pounding her, uh, or trying to get her within range. At this point here, the uh, captain realizing he's done all that, the, uh, all that he can, really, he's going to get captured if he carries on through the other end of the passage, and so he then turns, finds this cut, goodness knows how, he may have had pre-information, uh, and sails the ship straight up the beach. And that's exactly what he did. The English, obviously delighted, now we've got them. Because there's nowhere for them to run, there's jungle the other side. So they launch, you can imagine here, here's the dragon. This rose and everything else doesn't exist, it's all jungle, so to speak, trees and everything else. Here we've got uh, a 70-gun ship of the line, and we've got a 50-gun here, all within total range. And so the English said, right, we've got them. We got them. We're going to launch two longboats with 20 men each to accept their surrender. And so while the English were rowing out there, Captain Dupree was getting his men off, the powder, the shot. They were literally jumping off the bow onto the sandy beach. And he removed his bow chasers and set them up on the stern as stern guns and kept on firing. So the English had to row back to their ships, and the battle continued. And uh, the 
a general from the Monte Cristi garrison of Dragoons, Spanish Dragoons, came along and then the spy officially handed his documentation over to the general and Captain Dupree's mission had been fulfilled. Not exactly as he would like, because he's lost his ship, but nevertheless his mission was a success. The document had been, and the parcels and packages had been supplied. So, having done all that the honor of war required him to do, he, his first lieutenant and seven loyal men, went back on board the ship and set demolition charges to the rear section of the hull of the vessel and blew up his entire vessel, uh, which explains why we're missing uh, the last 15 feet and we're missing so much of the superstructure. We made uh, a number of publications. Uh, this is one in Paula Science uh, in France where they did a nice, they commissioned a nice painting which basically uh, graphically uh, visualizes the success of the French in destroying their vessel and in evading capture. Um, from our viewpoint, from archaeology, the story was complete. Um, the only one thing left to do, which was a bit of a risky move on our part, was to further protect and to ensure the future protection of this site. And so working with the French ambassador, uh, the uh, government of France, uh, National uh, Maritime Museum in France, we managed to get the French Foreign Office to officially serve notice, uh, to reclaim the vessel as sovereign property of the Republic of France, and it is now, it has the same status as the French Embassy in Santo Domingo, and it is a unique part of France uh, right on the beach in the sense that it now belongs to France, and uh, hopefully that will enable the ship to be left alone. Uh, we covered her all up again and uh, buried her, sandbagged her, protected her um, as got as much as possible, and hopefully she will rest in peace knowing that uh, she has now been returned uh, to her last owner and that the story is still being investigated. We're finding more and more things about Captain Dupuy. In fact, one of my students is now doing a PhD uh, on the captain, which is wonderful, Florence. Uh, she's doing excellent work over there. And it's quite amazing how a very small wreck, which no one knew anything about, can yield uh, such important uh, information about what was the last French warship lost in the American Revolutionary War. And I think a couple of days after that, the war ended. And uh, who knows what would have happened had further communications and the mission completed for the Turks and Caicos. That war might have gone on a bit longer. So there we are, ladies and gentlemen. I thank you very much uh, for your kind attention. And that's the story of the dragon. Thank you.